Hi, everyone, and welcome back to the Learning Adobe FrameMaker webinar series. I am Barb Binder, and I'll be the presenter for this session, which is going to focus on the use of generated files in Adobe FrameMaker. If you've been watching the series, you already know who I am. So very briefly, here's a bit of background. I'm the owner and lead instructor at Rocky Mountain Training. We are based outside of Denver, Colorado. I am an Adobe certified instructor and have been certified since 1997 on a variety of applications. I'm also an Adobe community expert, which means I answer questions on the Adobe community forums. If you would like to stay in touch after the webinar, you are welcome to reach out to me. My email is visible right now on that top line. If you're looking for training classes, you can visit the Rocky Mountain Training site. Uh, the Rocky Mountain Training blog is a compilation of student questions and answers that I started uh, recording in 2009. You can filter it so it just shows you FrameMaker questions and answers if that's what you're looking for. There is a lot of content on that blog. And if you want to go further than that, you can go out to the Adobe Community Forums. There is a FrameMaker forum within the Adobe Community, and I'm one of the moderators on that forum. I'm one of many people who will swing by daily to answer user questions from people from all over the world. Uh, both the blog and the community forums are great places to get answers when you need them. Okay, so our topic for today is using generated files in FrameMaker. And let me start by giving you a few concepts to think about before I get into the software. The first thing is that the generated files are created by FrameMaker by extracting content from your documentation, either by specifying paragraph styles or by specifying markers. In either case, you, the user, have to prepare these files for FrameMaker being able to collect the content. If you're working with uh, something that's collecting paragraphs, you do that by assigning paragraph styles and telling FrameMaker which styles you want to collect. Or you do it by adding marker text. Markers are definitely more time intensive, but both have their roles, and I'll cover both. These generated files are going to update during a book update, and I say mostly because it's possible uh, that you're going to use one of the ones I'm going to show you, which doesn't update with a book update. I want you to know that before you get into a situation where you're wishing it would. Uh, I want to remind you that the generated files follow an established set of rules. You're going to see a QR code on the right side of your screen. You can point yourself on at that, and it will take you to a blog entry on the Rocky Mountain Training blog that outlines all of those rules in a list. Uh, I've already taught that in the Advanced Topics webinar that was released at the end of 2022. It's up on YouTube. You can find it. So I won't be going over all the rules in order during this session. I'm assuming you've already seen that and have the basics, uh, but you can go back and look at that as well. And then one more thing I want you to be thinking about before I get going is that in the book window, you can differentiate a generated file from a file created by you, the user, by the icon color. The FrameMaker generated files are going to use an orange and black icon, and that becomes important when you are troubleshooting a document and wondering why your generated files aren't updating when the FrameMaker help says they're supposed to. I'll cover that as well. So the generated files fall into a few categories. The first category, and the one most of us think about wanting first, is a list of paragraphs. Specifically, Table of contents is a list of headings. That's all table of contents is. You say, I want to get all the headings for my document and put them in chronological order with their page numbers. And then we call that a table of contents. Other common lists of paragraphs are lists of figures, which is going to pull in the figure numbers and, and titles. And then lists of tables, which pulls in the table numbers and titles. List of paragraphs is another generic category, and that's going to be used in the list of effective pages. If you're here for that, I'm going to cover that in the next webinar. It's complicated, and we don't have enough time to cover all this and that in our hour together. Now, you can also work with an index, and at the first kind of index we see is an index of markers. And to help you visualize that, just consider a standard index. You insert index codes into your FrameMaker documentation, then you add the index of index markers to your FrameMaker book, and the content will get pulled in from the markers. It'll be presented alphabetically with group titles like the A group and the B group and the C group. That's an example of an index. There are other ones you can use. You can also create a list of markers. And one of the things I want to cover here is how is an index different from a list? FrameMaker has indexes and lists. 
Uh, I'll show you that as we go. So you could, instead of collecting the index markers into an index, you can make them a list. You don't want to, and I'll talk about what that looks like and why, but you can. And in some cases, it might be fine for other, other scenarios. And then finally, the least used category, but it can solve some issues, would be to create either an index or a list of references. And I'll show you what that looks like as well. You could get a list of all the imported graphics. You could get a list of all the fonts, a list of all the unresolved cross-references. These are items you're not putting into the marker box, but FrameMaker is tracking them. And you can pull those into a list if it's helpful for you. So that's the big picture. And then uh, the first thing I'd like to talk about in detail is the list of paragraphs. I'm going to create a book table of contents with you first. Now I've done this in previous webinars, so I'm going to just very quickly go through that book table of contents for two reasons. One is I wanna remind you how they work, but also I wanna show you a trick, how you can reuse a generated file. And that's my main reason for doing this first uh, exercise. Then I want to show you what a standalone table of contents is. People get confused by that term uh, versus a mini table of contents. Three different types of table of contents. And then we'll look at two other popular lists of paragraphs, a list of figures and a list of tables. Now, when you're in the book window, you choose the insert menu. You're going to see these four entries at the very bottom of the insert menu. The first two are used to create the lists, whether it's a table of contents or a list of figures or tables or paragraphs. Uh, note that you can have an alphabetical paragraph list if you want to. No group titles, no A's and B's and C's, but you can get them in alphabetical order from FrameMaker. You can also make lists of markers, alphabetical list of markers, and then that list of references. All of these are going to be lists and following the lists. I'll come back once this is done and we'll talk about the other two. These are going to be the variations on making an index. And I want you to understand how a list is different from an index. So that's part of where this is going. Let's start with the lists. So here we are in FrameMaker. I'm in FrameMaker 2022 and I have a book window open on the left hand side. This is the same book I've been using in the previous webinars. It's a spaceship document. You'll probably recognize it if you've been a part of the other webinars. I do want to remind you before I say anything else that this is a recorded webinar. I need to move quickly to get through all of the information in the hour. So um, if it feels too fast for you, I totally understand. It's also an advanced set of topics, so that might feel difficult if you're a newer user. You can always track down the webinar online and watch it as many times as you want. You can pause, you can rewind, you can take notes, listen again, whatever it takes to work through the materials if that is your goal. So that said, let's focus on the book window. So the book window appears on the left-hand side. I'm looking at my book window by uh, showing the first paragraph of every chapter. And I do want to open up all the files in the book, and I'll use a shortcut for that. I'm in the book window. I'm going to hold the shift key and go to the file menu. And that's going to change the command from open, where I have to pick the files, to open all files in book. So when I click that, all of the book files are going to open in order across the top of my screen. When I go back to the cover file, here it is. You can see the first paragraph on the cover file. Let me go ahead and show my text symbols so they're visible. There we go. That's my first paragraph. That's what appears in the book window. If I go to the legal file, the first paragraph says legal. That's what appears in the book window. You can modify that. If you click the, the second to last button on the book toolbar to the left of the magnifying glass, that's a toggle. You can see file names. And you can see the first paragraph, file name, first paragraph. I'm going to leave it on file names for right now as I'm talking about the file names, but you can leave it on either one when you're working. It's just a personal decision. I also want to point out in the book window the icons that precede all the file names. Those are all white and orange icons. White and orange icons indicate user created files or non-generated files. When we generate a file in FrameMaker and FrameMaker is in charge of that file, you can see it stand out from the user files because it'll have that orange and black icon I referenced earlier. There's not one in there yet. It'll be there in just a moment. So what we want to do here is we want to go ahead and add a table of contents for this document. I'm going to ask FrameMaker to grab the uh, heading zeros, which is my are my chapter titles the heading ones and also the heading twos. 
and I'll do get get FrameMaker to type all these in for us by specifying their style names. FrameMaker will then get the content of the text using those style names, and it will type it up very quickly into a list for us. So all that happens by adding a file to the book window. I want to add the table of contents above legal, so I'm going to select legal and go to the insert menu. In the book window, at the bottom of the book of the insert menu in the book window, all of the generated files are listed down below. The first two create lists, the second two create indexes. I'll differentiate between those as we go. But the first one FrameMaker thinks you're going to want is a table of contents, and that's exactly it. Do note that the wording has changed from version to version. So yours might say something slightly different from create TOC. Close enough, you'll figure it out. This is 2022's wording. It just has been an on ongoing changeable bit of text. So I'm going to pick create TOC, and that's going to open up this the uh, setup table of contents dialog box. There we go. Uh, and let's look at that for just a moment. So starting at the top, the first thing that we see is a suffix for that file. That suffix is going to appear in three different places in a generated file. It's going to be part of the file name. And file names are important in these generated files. The file names follow a predictable pattern. You can easily understand the pattern. It's going to be the book name. This is the spaceship book, so spaceship, and then the suffix .fm. I know that's going to be the name of the table of contents before I even put it in because I've made a few before in my life. Notice also, by the way, the orange and black icon. So that means it's a generated file. Okay, so book name plus suffix.fm is the file name. It adds it before legal because I said I, I had legal selected, but I can add it above or below legal. And then in the do not include list, I figure out what styles I want to include. And in no particular order, I'm going to double click heading 0, 1, and 2. If I double click heading 3 and put it in the include list and then think better of it, I don't want that long a table of contents. I can just double click it and return it to the do not include list. And again, FrameMaker is going to locate any text with these three style names in this entire book, find the content, type it up into a document with the text, a space, and then a page number. And down here, I do want to include hypertext links. These are beneficial for two reasons. One, when you're in FrameMaker and you see a mistake in a table of contents, you can hyperlink into the source and fix it. So there's that. And then when you export to another format, let's say PDF, you'll have clickable links. So I'm going to leave that turned on. And I'm almost ready to click OK. But before I do, let's just think about where that content is going to go. Take a look at the book window. FrameMaker is going to find the first non-generated file in the book window. In this document, that's cover. Here's my first generated file. Cover is my first non-generated file. It's going to use that as the template to hold the content. It's going to look at that file and see if there is a reference page with instructions on how to present the content. If it's there, FrameMaker will use that reference page information. It'll be called the TOC reference page. So if it finds that, it'll yield use it. But if you're setting up a table of contents for the very first time in FrameMaker, you've never done it before, it's never been done before in your office, that's not going to be there. So FrameMaker is just going to look at cover, not find a reference page, and say, OK, I'll use this as my template. It will erase the content from the cover page, and it will pour in the table of contents content. It will be unformatted when you see it, which is fine. So let's do that. I'm going to go ahead and pick OK. Now keep an eye on, oh, hit OK here too, update here. Keep an eye on the right side of my screen. You're going to see it flash by very quickly. Something happened over there. It was too fast to watch. It has completed the typing, and the file is open, but it's sitting behind my other files. So what I need to do now is just go to my book window and double-click Spaceship TOC, and the file will open. And it looks just like the contents file does, only the, the, the cover file does, only the content has been removed and replaced with the information from the uh, source documents. I'm going to just go ahead and dock it so it's not blocking everything. Okay. Uh, I want to just also point out to you that the style names are as I predicted. This general description was a heading zero in the original document. It's now a heading zero TOC. See the suffix at the end? They're going to be heading one TOCs in here and heading, uh, let's go to crew area, heading two TOCs. And if you were going to continue on from here, you would now have to spend time formatting this file. 
you would set up the paragraph styles, you would add a title, you would set up the master pages, you would set up the reference page because the reference pages in these generated files are going to control the presentation. If you don't want to have a space between the text and the page number, you want a tab, you do it on the reference page. Okay, so that's the basic idea here. Now, I want to show you how to reuse a generated file because one of the great things about FrameMaker is it loves to share. It doesn't hold on to things. It shares formatting with other files and makes it really easy if you just know how to ask. So let me back up. I'm going to delete this file and I'm not going to save it. So it's not actually on the hard drive. I'm not saving it. I'm also going to pull it out of the book window. There's a little trash can here. It's going to pull it out. And I'm back to where we started again. And now I want to go find a generated file from a different project and bring it into this project and use the formatting from the other file for this particular document. Here's a scenario. Let's say you were hired to design a document in FrameMaker on submarines. And so you learn FrameMaker, you made the submarine chapters, you made a book, you eventually made a beautiful table of contents and perhaps a beautiful index and the whole document's working like it's supposed to. You've got it finished, you sent it out, and it's done. And your office says, wow, great job on the submarine project. Let's go work on a spaceship project. And now we're in the situation where we've got the spaceship project almost finished. We just need the generated files, and we don't want to have to reformat them from scratch. And we don't need to. So here's how you're going to handle that. I'm opening up the folder that contains my project files. In the left column, you can see my book file is down here at the bottom. You can see all the chapters that are part of this. There are also backup files because I like to have the backup files turned on. And because they're open, the LCK files are there. But there's nothing in here at all about a table of contents or eventually an index. So let's look at the top of my, my folder. I've got a folder in here called Submarine Project, and pretend this is that example I just gave you a minute ago, that scenario I just painted for you. It's going to be everything pertaining to the Submarine Project. Now, I have uh, called it down so that all I have in there are the generated files, not making you look at all the other things that would be there for the book and all of the uh, chapters. Here's the key to how this would work. If you can find a, a successful table of contents from another, another project, you can copy it to your project. So I'm just going to grab the TOC and bring it over to my working project folder, which is this one. And you can see the file has arrived. It's down here. It says submarine TOC. This is a spaceship book. It's not about submarines. And what I need to do to get FrameMaker to use this TOC is give it the predicted file name, which I've already specified for you. The generated files are always going to use the name of the book. In our case, it's Spaceship, followed by the suffix for that file. So spaceship toc.fm. I'm just renaming it. I don't need to pull out the content about submarines. It can be in there. FrameMaker will pull it out for me, so I'm not going to do anything I don't have to do. And FrameMaker is going to see this file when I insert the table of contents back into the document. So I'm going to go back to FrameMaker and do the same thing we just did. I've got legal selected. I'm going to go to the insert menu. I'm going to click on create table of contents. I need to tell it which styles I want to include. Heading zero, heading one, heading two. I'm not changing uh, anything else except for some reason I had cover selected. So I want to add it below cover. So I need to change that. That's it. Okay. But still TOC, still want the link, still want these styles. Now, last time I did this, FrameMaker looked at the first non-generated file, which was called cover, pulled out the content and dropped in the unformatted list. This time it's going to find the file with the expected name in the folder. There's a file in there that says spaceship toc.fm. That's the name it wanted to use. It's poured this content right in. And when I open it up, it's fully formatted, which is great. That's how you reuse a generator file. It works for any of the generator files. You just have to know what FrameMaker was going to call it, book name plus suffix.fm. Once you know that, as you work on project after project after project, you're going to save a lot of time. It can take a half an hour to 45 minutes to format a table of contents for the very first time, especially if you're new. 
So there's that. That's a great thing. Now, a couple more things about generated files before I move on. Um, one is you do not want to type on a generated file. If you add content, let's pretend that that's an important edits, and you type on a generated file, and then you update your book. The penalty for doing that is FrameMaker will actually remove content that you add. So as I update the book and I come back, you can see that content is gone. So how do I edit this? Well, you have to edit the source files. And remember how we have hypertext links turned on? These markers at the beginning of every line are hypertext link markers. I'm going to control alt and click on what I want to edit. Control alt click. It's going to hyperlink me into the document. It's going to highlight the text I'm trying to change. And I can make a modification like I could add the long history of flight. So I'm changing the source file. When I return to my table of contents, the change is not reflected until I update my book. At that point of hitting update, FrameMaker is going to scan through all the documents, look for anything that might have changed, pull the content out of the source files, and drop it off back here again. And that's where the update shows up. So that's the basic idea of these, these generated files. I'm going to continue on with variations now, but you'll see it's going to work in a very similar manner. The rules I'm establishing are going to continue. Uh, before I do the next two table of contents, though, I do want to address a question we keep getting on the forums. Uh, it happens to a lot of people, and I just don't know what you're doing, but let me tell you how you fix it. So quick note over here. This is something you don't want to do. Just be aware of it. Uh, if for some reason you pull out a generated file from the book, and when you click the trash can, you do not delete the file on the disk just from the book. So if I pull the spaceship file out of the book, it's no longer here. And then I realize, oh, I don't have my generated file. To add it back in, you do not want to use insert files. If you use insert files, which is used to add user files, that's the same thing as the add files button over here on the toolbar. If you use it, you're going to add it back in again, but it won't be a generated file. So if I come down to the spaceship TOC, it's back in my list. I want it to sit here, but it doesn't have the orange and black icon. So if I were to go to general description and I delete the long, pull that back out again, and then I go back to my table of contents and I update my book, it's not going to pick it up. It's still going to be there when I come back because it's not a generated file. So we get that question all the time. Why is my table of contents not updating? I see it, it's a generated file. Well, if it's white and orange, it's not a generated file. It was, but it's not. So here's what you do. You pull it back out and then you add it back in correctly. This is for user files. This is for the generated files. Choose create TOC, set it up one more time. Heading zero, heading one, heading two. Everything else is good, except I still want it to go after the cover. And then when you pick OK, it's going to add it back in. And it's updating the book at that time so that when it comes back in again, it picked up that change I made when it wasn't a generated file. And now it's going to be updating every single time. That's a little tip. Okay, so now we understand how that book table of contents works. Let's look at a standalone table of contents. To get ready for that, I'm going to go to my book window. I'm going to hold the shift key and go to file, save all files in book. Then file, close all files in book. And then I'm going to reopen the general description. So a book table of contents is generated for the entire book. A standalone table of contents is an option to generate a table of contents for a single chapter in its own file. It will use the file that you're in as the template for uh, pouring the content in. And here's how that works. I'm in the file. I am not in the book. I'm in the file over on the right. You can see my cursor. And so when I go to the insert menu in a document, the list looks a little bit different because now I'm in a document, not in a book. 
Um, what I'm looking for is a standalone TOC. When I click it, I'm going to get a dialog box saying, are you sure you want to do this? Don't you want to create a book? And I don't. I want to make a standalone TOC. So I'll choose create standalone TOC. And I'm going to go ahead and include everything again. So I'll just go ahead and choose OK. And FrameMaker creates a brand new file that just has what I asked for. It's not part of the book. It's just sitting over here as a separate document. I'm going to throw it in front because it makes more sense logically to me to find it if it's just sitting in front of this. Now it's completely unformatted and you don't want to watch me go through all the formatting commands. So I'm going to take a, another cheat step that will teach you something if you missed it in FrameMaker. Uh, I'm going to open up the table of contents for the actual book, which has everything fully formatted. And then I'm going to return to the TOC file over here. And as I said earlier, FrameMaker loves to share. I can go get the formatting from that other file as long as it's open. So I'm in the unformatted standalone TOC. I go to the file menu. I choose import formats, file import formats. I want to import the formatting from the file called spaceship. And I'll go ahead and import everything in there. You can deselect these various formatting categories and just bring in the paragraph styles, for example, or the character styles or the master pages or the table styles. Or you can play it safe and bring in everything. I'll select all. And then when I pick import, it's going to import all the formatting from the spaceship file. And this looks pretty good. Pretty good, but not great. Because it you can see that the paragraph styles matched up. Same name. So it's the paragraph styles matched up. But I still have a space here uh, between my text and my page numbers. And that's because as a rule for generated files, Reference page changes and importing the reference page has changed this reference page. Reference page changes don't take effect until you update your generated files. Now, here's the weird thing about the standalone files. They don't update as part of the book. They're not part of a book update. If I want to update this, I have to go and remember to do this back to the original document and then add it back in again. So I'm, I'm back in general. I act like I've never done it before. I come back to insert and I say, yep, I want to have a standalone table of contents. I really do. And I click create standalone. It says all this stuff still the same. And I say, yep. So I'll pick OK. And it's going to, at that point, read the references, see the tab, and then do the rest of the formatting. You have to remember to do it. Now, I definitely have clients that will have a standalone table of contents in front of each of their chapters. The burden of the standalones is that you have to remember to update them. They're not part of the book update. So that's a standalone table of contents. And then I'm going to go back to journal description and I'm going to add a mini table of contents. Now, I know a lot of people that use FrameMaker have used it for as long as I have, and you may well be part of this webinar. I'm wondering if you've missed something along the way, because we all do miss things along the way in FrameMaker. New features show up and they're quiet. Um, but years ago, years ago, a mini talk meant something different than it does today. A mini talk meant you would generate a standalone table of contents like that, and then you would embed it in a file as a text inset. There's now an official mini talk feature that's better than that. And I want to show that to you. So I'll put my cursor right here. I'm going to make it a little bit bigger so you can not be trying to see what I'm doing. Okay, I'll put my cursor right here. I want to get a list of the headings uh, to show up in between this paragraph and this paragraph. It's a table of contents that's embedded in this file. Uh, that command is, again, going to be the insert menu. And I'll say table of contents. And I'll say, I want a mini TOC. It's going to say, well, what do you want? And I don't want the heading ones. There's my heading one. Actually, that's my heading zero. I do want the heading ones. I don't want the heading zeros. I also want the heading twos, though. So let me bring those two in. So heading heading one and heading twos. Got it. One, two. Links. All good. And when I pick OK, it's going to come in as raw data. Now, the first challenge of a mini talk is you go to click on it, and you can't get into it because it comes in as a unit, it's protected from you. So you have to know that this information lives on those reference pages. So I'm going to go now to the view menu. I'm going to go to the reference pages. This is a mini talk. So the reference page I'm looking for is the mtalk reference page. The name appears just below my mouse. 
Now, all the generated pages, except for the standalone, are using these, you know, their own little reference pages here. So, well, standalone does too, just a little bit different. Uh, I'm going to erase the space and put in a tab, erase the space, and put in a tab. I'm going to select these two paragraphs. This is the heading two mTalk. This is the heading one mTalk. I'm going to select them both, show you another frame maker trick in case you didn't know it. Uh, that's just a general trick. In Paragraph Designer, if I select more than one paragraph, I can format them at the same time. So I'm going to go to Font and make a few decisions here. I want this to be Myriad Pro. I want this to be uh, bold. I want them to be bold. I think I want them to be size 10. This would be a little big if they're going to be bold. And then um, the button down here, I'd like it to say update style. Sometimes it does. I'm not sure why it goes back and forth, but it doesn't. So I'm going to click apply. And now it says update style. And then it's going to say, do you really need to change two paragraph styles at one time? I do. That's global updates. So when I pick update, it's going to update the H1 mTOX and the H2 mTOX at the same time. Okay. Now I'm going to go to basic properties and I'm going to indent them both a quarter inch. So there's a quarter inch indent. And I want space below each of them to be maybe three points. So I'll put a three. And I'm going to add a tab stop. So I'll make it a tab at 5.25 inches, a right align tab with leader dots. And I'll continue. I'll click apply so that I can update and then do the global updates. And then I'm going to select the um, H2, which is this one. I'm looking down here to see the name. I could also see it, but my designer is hiding it. So I'm looking down here at my status bar. I want that to have a little bit bigger indent, so I'm going to give it a half inch indent. I'm doing only one paragraph now, so when I update style, it uh, doesn't ask me about the global updates. Okay, that should be fine. Let's go see how that looks. I'll go to my view menu and I'll go to my body pages. And some of that has taken effect, but what hasn't taken effect is the replacement of the space with the tab because those reference page changes don't take effect until you update. So in a mini talk, you can right click to update. If I update the mini talk right here, I can update it while I'm looking at it, which is nice if I'm just making sure it's working. Um, but now what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to the history of flight right down here. I'm going to type in the, I think I missed the T though, because there's a marker there, I can't see it. I think that's right, the long, don't know what I'm doing there. Typing is not my forte. The long history of flight. Okay. And now I'm going to go to my book window. And here's my book update. When I click the book update, it's pre-checked. Where's my mouse? Here it is. It's pre-checked to update the mini talk. I don't have to update it manually. It'll do it with the book update. It's also pre-checked to update my table of contents. But it's not going to ever update the standalone. So when I click update, FrameMaker scans through everything and updates everything. And you can already see the mini talk is, is showing you the update. It says the long history of flight. That's this one. And when I go to my table of contents, it says the long history of flight. But when I go to my standalone TOC for general description, it doesn't have it. I would have to go back to the, the source file, and then I would have to act like I had never made one before and go back to insert, table of contents, create standalone table of contents. Yes, I want a standalone table of contents. Yes, I want the same information. And I have to remember to do that, and that's always an issue. So now it's picked it up. Okay. That's a look at the three different kinds of table of contents. You've got one for the book. It looks at everything in the book, updates when you update your book. You can have one embedded inside the document. And this is really handy for someone to get an overview of what's inside this technical document chapter. And that can update with the book. And then we have the more awkward, older, standalone table of contents feature, which I would avoid if you can. If you don't need it, use the mini talk instead. So let's wrap up the session on 
list of paragraphs by generating a list of figures and a list of tables. Both are very quick. They're using the same concepts we've already set up. Uh, let me get organized here. I'm going to close the table of contents. Yes, I want to save it. I'm going to close the standalone. Not worried about it, but I guess I'll save it. And then um, in the first chapter, which I have open here, let me just show you page two. I've got figures in here and they have figure captions with figure numbers. The style name is FC figure caption. And also in this document, there are tables. And so the, there's, there's my first table. This one's using a style called uh, TC table caption. A list of figures is just a list of all the figure captions and a list of tables is a list of all the table titles or table captions. Whatever you want to call these styles is completely up to you. To save some time, I'm going to go to my uh, my project folder, and I have a folder in here called Generated Files, and I've got a sample of each of these different kinds of generated files I'm going to be creating. I'm going to just grab them all now. They do have the right name already, by the way. They're already named Spaceship, so I'm just going to grab those and put them in the project folder, and I'll explain this as I go, but I'm putting them in there so they're ready to go. I'll go back to the project folder, and they're all sitting down here. Now, these are going to work because I know what the names are going to be uh, assigned when we add these files. So I want to cover a list of figures first. Just notice there's a file with FrameMaker's expected name, Spaceship LOF, in the folder. And so that what that means is when I go to my book and I click on, let's say, Legal, when I decide I want to add a list of figures, I'll go to the Insert menu, I'll come down to List of, and it says, how about a list of figures? Sure. So I'll click on list of figures. Now it's going to add the file that it found in that folder in here. Same name, right? Everything is great, except that I want to grab the figure captions because in this particular document, that's the style name. And that's all I need. Just give me a list of all the figures in this document. When I click OK, it's not going to be raw data because I'm reusing a generated file in theory from a previous project that has been renamed to the correct name so that when I pick OK, FreeMaker is going to find it. It's going to pour the content in and it will be fully formatted once we see it. There it is. So I went ahead and added bold to the figure numbers on the reference pages. Um, just looking at the reference page for this particular document. Remember, the suffix for this file is LOF, so I'm looking for the LOF reference page, and I just came along here and I added a character style to the numbers so that they'd be in bold. These are the building blocks on the reference page that control the presentation on the body pages. All these generated files are going to have you manipulate the reference page building blocks and then update your book to see the results. Okay, so I'm going to go back to the body pages. And I'm going to be a little bit smarter and open all the files in the book. That way it will generate the, um, what, I don't know what I just did. Let me try that again. Uh, oh, I'm not in the book window, perhaps. File. Open all files in book. There they go. And now I want to add a list of tables. So again, I'm going to click on legal. I'm going to insert a list of, and I'll choose tables. It's got the name that's uh, sitting in the folder that I just copied over. All I have to do is figure out what the table style name is. And in this template, it's called uh, TC Table Caption. Put it in the Include list, pick OK, and Update. It should generate a little bit more quickly this time. There it goes. And then I want to look at it. So here we are. There's a list of tables. These have hyperlinks in both cases, list of figures, list of, list of tables. I can control all click, pop in. Turns out I forgot a title here, so I will pop in. It's just an empty table, so I had some to work with, so I'll just say sample. Table. Come on, Barb, you can do it. Go back to my list of tables, and then when I update my book, it will run through all those again and update. Good. Uh, I'm just going to point this out. 
in the insert menu, there is a list of paragraphs. That's what an LOEP is going to use, list of effective pages. It's just a list of paragraphs. You're collecting the revision dates and revision numbers from the body pages and making a list of paragraphs. I'll cover that in the next webinar because it's got a lot of other stuff that goes on that's too complicated. Um, and if you're doing a list of paragraphs, it can be alphabetical. You could generate an alphabetical table of contents by saying, I want an alphabetical list of paragraphs, and then just ask for the headings. That's the same thing a table of contents is. So it would be alphabetical, but it wouldn't have the group titles you're about to see in the next exercise. Um, I'll come back to markers and references. So that completes the look at the list of paragraphs. Uh, let's now look at an index and just compare the presentation of a list to an index. I'm going to start with a standard index like you'll see in the back of a book. Uh, I then am going to move into a glossary index and compare it to a glossary list, simply meant to give you a point to point comparison of an index versus a list. Okay. So I am going to go reuse a generated file for the index again. You get the idea here. I'm going to go to my fictional summary project. I'm going to take the summary index file and I'm going to copy it to my project folder. Head to my project folder. Now, because I'm reusing a file from a previous project, I need to rename it to use the name that FreeMaker is going to use anyway. So I'm looking for the summary index and I need to change it to spaceship index and then return to frame maker okay i am going to pick a sample file and i want to open up the marker box for just a moment so i'm going to show you a standard index and i again i talked about this in detail in the last webinar of 2022 on advanced topics in frame maker you can track it down on youtube as a quick reminder an index requires more work than a list of paragraphs does because you have to put markers in. The index is going to collect the marker content. A list can collect marker content. It mostly collects paragraph styles. Those are easy. They're in there anyway. But markers require more thought. So I see a marker right here. I've got my marker box open. If I double click the word escape, uh, it just delayed there. There we go. You can see that there is an index marker for the words crew area. That's a level one entry because there's no colon. If I come over here, it looks like there's an index marker. No, nope, that's a cross reference marker. There's one. Uh, this one says escape colon system. That means that everything to the left of the colon is a level one index entry. Everything to right is a level two. So under the escape category, there's a subcategory called system. Somebody has to decide what goes in an index. Somebody, same person or someone different, has to put all these markers in. But once they're there, generating an index is super simple. Even easier for us because we're going to reuse the submarine index file and we're already set up for that. So all I need to do to add an index is go to contacts. I want to add it below contacts. I'll go to insert. I'm going to bypass all the lists now and come down to the next category, which says, how about a standard index? That's all I want. And just pointing out all the similarities, you can see the suffix is IX. That's going to be part of the file name. It's going to be the IX reference page. It's going to be appended to the styles that it automatically generates. I want to add it after contacts. I want to include all the index markers, and I want to include hypertext links. There are other markers you can include. I'll come back to that in a minute. Just keeping it simple. I'll pick OK. FrameMaker is now going to scan through all these chapters looking for any index markers. It's going to collect them, put them in alphabetical order, and pour them into the old spaceship template. So as I open up, uh, sorry, the old submarine template. So I open up spaceship, they come in fully formatted. Now I want to zoom in so you can see better what's happening here. And I want to go to the view menu and hide the uh, text symbols for a moment so you can see what it looks like. And you can see that an index is going to always produce an alphabetical sorting and it will include index titles. So there's a B above the B entries, a C above the C entries, a D above the D entries. This is all controllable by X reference page but it's collecting those markers and alphabetizing them. And it's assigning paragraph styles. Anything that is marked as a level one 
in the index, which is before a colon, is going to be assigned a style called index, uh, sorry, level one IX. Anything after the colon is a level two IX. Remember, each colon in an index marker produces another level. So if you have multiple levels, you might have more, more entries. When you see a mistake, you do not want to fix it here. If you do, the penalty is FrameMaker removes it when you update your book. So when you see a mistake, and for example, I've got a duplicate entry here. I've got crew area on page 15, but areas on 6. You just control alt click It will find the marker for you. The marker is physically up here. I don't have my text symbol showing, but the marker is sitting right here. All I need to do is go to my marker box and make a modification. Is that the one I wanted? I don't think so. Let me try that one more time. Spaceship. Control alt click on six. There it is. Must be two markers there. I don't know how I found the other one. And I'm going to backspace. And I'm going to save. And I'm going to go back to the index and update my book. It's going to realize that they're now um, the same entry. So they're going to be in there with both page numbers on that particular page. I meant on the same line. Okay, so that's a standard index. A lot of time and effort goes into figuring out what goes in this and then adding the markers. Generating the index is pretty quick. In many cases, you have access to collecting the same information, but present it as either a list or an index. I want you to be able to see what the two are. Now, to illustrate this, I'm going to create a very simplified version of a glossary list. And a glossary list is going to have a term and a definition. Let me go ahead and open up a document as I get ready to talk about it. So I'm going to go to page one here. Okay, so you can see that I've got a term, propeller-based flight, and a definition, a type of fan, rocket-based flight, and has a definition. So I'll just use these as my term and definition, term and definition. Before I start, let me say that a lot of my students will have a glossary list at the back of their book. They don't use a generator file for it. They just type it in. They don't care about page numbers. They just want to have the terms and their definitions, and they're good with that. And so they type it up in alphabetical order, and uh, that's the end of that. They're done. That's the, an example of the simplest way of creating a glossary. There's also a complex way of create, creating a glossary. If you're outputting to a dynamic format like HTML5 or Web Help, in that environment, you would use two different kinds of markers. One would, rec would identify the term, and one identifies the definition. And then you use that same term marker for each occurrence of where that term might appear. And when you export to one of those dynamic formats, you can specify how to export those markers so that the user who's reading document online in a dynamic format can see the definition for a term while they're reading right there which is great. It's not going to work in a print document, and it's not going to work in a PDF document. Uh, and I'm not going to teach that. I don't have time to get into that. So I'm doing a very simplified version of, you know, just one step beyond what my, most of my, my students are doing. It's going to type the list up for you. I'm not sure it's any quicker. Uh, I'm doing this so specifically because I want to give you a direct comparison between a list and an index, and it's something you can identify with if I use the glossary concept. There are other ones that might require more setup. So that's all I'm going to say there. Okay, let me add some markers. I'm going to begin by going to the view menu, and I want to show the text symbols. There are no markers in those paragraphs. And I'm just going to very quickly select this text, which is my term. I'm going to copy it to the clipboard. I'm going to select this text. I'm going to go to my marker box, and I'm going to be choosing glossary. It took it. And again, there's two, there's two markers up here because of the two-step process I just described. I'm keeping it simple. And I'm going to click in front of the um, definition, and I'm going to paste in the text, and I'm going to put in a colon. So a colon is used to separate the um, term from the definition, and I'll click Create. Let me just do that one more time. I'm going to grab Rocket Base Flight. I'm going to copy it to the clipboard. I'm going to grab the definition. I'm going to click at the beginning. I'm going to paste in Rocket Base Flight followed by a colon. The colon separates the term from the definition, and I'll click Create. I have a total of two glossary markers in this entire book, 
but I want to use that as my way of showing you a direct comparison. So I'm going to go to my index file in the book window. I'm going to go to the insert menu and I'm going to come down and pick insert, uh, uh, excuse me, index of markers. Which marker do I want? I want glossary markers. That's what I'm using. So I'll double click it. An index of markers has an IOM suffix index of markers. When I click create and I update, it's going to scan through this entire FrameMaker book. It's going to find a total of two markers, type them up in alphabetical order with the group titles on top, like an index. Let me double click it so you can see what it looks like. And I'm going to turn off my text symbols so that you can see that I've got two entries and it's pre-formatted because I copied a sample file over earlier in this exercise. Next one's also going to come in pre-formatted. Now that's an index, alphabetical, group titles, nice formatting controls. Let me do this one more time. I'm just going to insert it again. But this time I'll make it a list of markers rather than an index of markers. It could be alphabetical or not. It will never have the group titles, it'll never have the ABC groups. I'm just going to say markers. And I want the same markers and OK. And again, it's doing the same thing. It's scanning all the documents and it's going to produce a much simpler, less easy to control the formatting kind of a list. So as nice as this glossary index looks with all these pieces, the uh, LOM, the list of markers, is going to just have the content and not much going on. It actually has the colon in there. It doesn't know to specify that this is one, one style and that's another style. It just brings it all in. So it's just a raw list. And there's nothing wrong with raw lists if you're generating them for your own use. You just want to see what markers are in here. You can make a list of markers and just go through them. If you're presenting them to somebody else, you might, and like in the back of your book, you might consider a prettier format. You definitely get more control with an index than you do with a list. So that's the difference between an index and a list. Before I move on to the last type of a generated file in FrameMaker, I want to take a moment to show you a new feature in the fall release of FrameMaker 2022. So this is just in the most current version of FrameMaker. It's a feature called the last line right indent. I know some of you have probably not realized it has appeared in your paragraph designer. Others might have noticed it, but have no idea why it's there. I want to just show it to you because it can be used in any of these different kinds of lists. If you have multiple lines and you're trying to make the page numbers stand out on the right hand side. Um, what I'm going to do is place my cursor in my glossary level two entry. And I want to show you the paragraph designer basic properties, indents. Um, what we have is a first line indent of a quarter inch right now. That's going to take the first line and move it in a quarter of an inch. That only impacts the first line of any paragraph in FrameMaker. But we also have a quarter inch left indent. And in FrameMaker, the left indent will impact the second and subsequent lines of a multi-line paragraph. So to get these paragraphs to be indented on the left-hand side, I needed both a first line indent and a left indent. Now, historically, we've only had a right indent uh, on the other side, and that would impact all the lines of a paragraph. But if you look more closely in FrameMaker 2022, we have a right indent value and a last, light, a last line right indent value. They can be different. If I leave the last line right indent value at zero, but I increase the right indent, FrameMaker is going to indent all the lines on the right-hand side, except for the last one, a half an inch. So when I update style, you can see that I've indented this text, so the line numbers stand out at a glance. It's way easier to do than we did in other older versions of FrameMaker, where there was a workaround that we would use with um, setting up word spacing and try to get FrameMaker to do this for us. Now it's super easy. You can build it into your generated files. I've been waiting for this feature for a long time because I've got documents where my table of contents has really long lines, very long titles that wrapped multiple lines. And I want them to stand out like this. So that's the last line right indent. That value can be different on the last line than all the other lines. Typically, you'll use it in one of the generated files, and you'll typically leave it at zero, 
while you indent the other lines of the paragraph. It's basically the opposite of a first line indent where the left side first line on the left comes in. This is letting the last line, the bottom right, stick out. Okay, so that's the last line right into it. Makes me really happy. We're now arriving at the final type of generated file in FrameMaker. We've talked about lists of paragraphs. Those are really easy to set up because you just have to reference the paragraph styles you're looking for. We've talked about lists and indexes of markers. Those are more time consuming because you have to add the markers to the document and then tell FrameMaker to go type up all the contents of those markers. Those are used predominantly in our FrameMaker generated files. But the last kind of a file is a list or an index of references. And the good news about this is that you don't have to do any prep work on these. Um, these are features you're probably using in FrameMaker anyway. If you want a list of one of these things, you just tell FrameMaker that you want either a list or an index of references, and it will type this up for you. Um, years ago, these lists were really important because if you were troubleshooting a document and you had problems, for example, a common problem that all of us deal with is unresolved cross-references. We open up a FrameMaker document, it says, you have unresolved cross-references. And you're thinking, oh no, how did I break them? What we could do years ago is generate a list, for example, of unresolved cross-references. It would have all the cross-references with their page numbers. And we could hyperlink into each one of them and resolve them and continue to update the book until the list was empty because there were no longer any unresolved cross-references. That works for um, worked for condition tags and fonts and text insets, imported graphics. Now, since the early days of FrameMaker, Adobe has added panels within FrameMaker to do most of these things. We really don't need to generate these lists anymore unless you're just, you like that workflow. We still can, they're still here. Um, but you, for example, with that cross-reference example, if you go to the view menu and you go to panels in current versions of FrameMaker, you can ask to see the cross-references panel. And it will have a list of all the cross-references. You'll see a green X if it's a good cross-reference that's working correctly. You'll see a red X if it's an unresolved cross-reference. And you can work through that list in the panel within FrameMaker to resolve those cross-references until all you have are the green X's. If you have font issues, there are font panels that you can open up to help you manage your fonts. There's one for text insets, so you can manage your text insets. Now, the one that's still relevant today and I still get asked about with some regularity is a list of imported graphics. And there's no panel for that within FrameMaker at this point. So I'll use that as my example of a list or an index of references. I want to generate a list of all the imported graphics. When I ask for it, FrameMaker is going to search through the document. It's going to collect the file name of any imported graphics. It's going to show us the location. It's going to show us the resolution. And it's going to show us the page number that it appears on. So it's very handy for getting a sense of how those your graphics have been organized and if they're working correctly or not. Let me show you what that looks like. I'm in my book window. I want to add this new file under the spaceship file, spaceship uh, index of markers file. So I'll go to the insert menu. I'm going to come down to list of, and I'm going to click references. When I pick references, I'm going to get a list of all the imported graphics with their folder and their file name and their resolution and their page number in chronological order, like all the other lists. Uh, there is an option to choose an index of references. It has the exact same options that you can pick from, but the presentation will be different because we looked at how an index is different from a list. So I'm going to go back to list of and produce a chronological list of references. The file has an extension of LOR list of references. So it's using spaceship LOR.fm. I want to add the file after the spaceship IOM file. That's the index of markers file. It won't move underneath though until I click OK. I want to include all the imported graphics. So I'm going to ask for a list of imported graphics. I do want hyperlinks. And when I choose OK and then update, FrameMaker is combing through this document. It's making a, a list of all of the uh, references for the imported graphics. There it goes. 
And it's going to come in fully formatted because like the other files in these examples, I went ahead and copied a file with the appropriate name and formatting to the folder before I generated it. So as I open it up, it's good to go. Now you can see that it has a list of uh, the folder that all these files are in. In this particular document, I'm working with a project folder. All the graphics are supposed to be in a subfolder called assets. This tells me that they are. They're not spread across my drive. They're all in the correct location. Then it shows me the file names. It shows the resolution and it shows the page numbers. The resolution is a bit low on these first three. That's an indicator that I might want to go work on these files and replace them with a more a higher res version of those three graphics. But that's a list of imported graphics right there. So I can see at a scanning level how many graphics I have, where they're located, what they're called, what the resolution is, and their page numbers. And that's a list of references. I have one last tip to share before we wrap up this session. This is just a best practice. You'll notice that in several of my generated files, I chose to bold content within the document. So for example, I've got bold text in front of the content over here on the right. I added the chapter numbers and I added a character style that makes this content bold. Uh, if I show you the view menu and I show you my text symbols, the hypertext markers are barely visible, but they're visible, meaning I can hypertext link into the content to, to make a modification. Um, but when you add character styles to your paragraphs, this is true whether you're in a generated file or in a regular document, regular paragraph, although it comes up in the forms mostly as a question about the generated files. It's going to limit the hotspot area to just what has a character style assigned. Uh, the rule in FrameMaker is if you have a hypertext link marker in a paragraph with no character styles, the entire paragraph is clickable. If you add a character style and put the marker inside the character style, only the boundaries of the character style is clickable. So I did this here, but I also did it in the list of tables and the list of figures, specifically because I wanted to just talk about how you can remove these so that this will work correctly. Let me go ahead and show you. Um, if I Control alt click on figure uh, 1.2, which is here's the marker. It's within the character style. It's going to hyperlink in. But if I go back and I control alt click on the text or the page number, it doesn't go anywhere. And that's because I've got the characters, the hypertext link within that character style. So here's my last tip. As a best practice, don't use character styles on your generated files. To remove this, I would just go back to the view menu. I would go to the reference pages. This is my LOF reference page. Remember, it has the name down here at the bottom. If I select this content and I go to my character catalog and I say default paragraph font and I remove it. And then I go back to my body pages, view menu, body pages. And I update my book because reference page changes don't take effect till you update your book. And now when I hyperlink, I can go anywhere on that line. Let me close this. Anywhere on that line, including on the page numbers. And the whole line is going to be clickable and take me into that area. So I really should do the same thing on the list of tables and the list of references. We really don't want to use character styles on the reference pages of our generated files because it limits a hotspot or the clickable area on the hypertext linking. It works that way in FrameMaker and also when you carry this file to a PDF, you export to a PDF, the only clickable area is going to be the area that has the character style assigned to it. And that concludes this webinar. Thank you all so much for coming. We definitely appreciate it. Remember, I'm Bar Binder with Rocky Mountain Training. We have training classes. You are welcome to email me. I've been loving the thank you notes that have been coming in uh, since that first webinar. That makes my day each time. So thank you, each of you who reached out after a webinar to let me know that you appreciated it. That's been really great. If you need training, my website is there. You can always look up questions on my blog. And the single quickest way to get questions answered is to visit us on the Adobe FrameMaker Community Forum. Just go to community.adobe.com and look for FrameMaker. Ask us your questions. There's a bunch of us there who would love to answer your questions for you. 
it's the quickest way to get an answer because if one of us is traveling or um, in class or whatever, there's somebody else there who can give you a hand. Okay, everybody, I'll see you at the next webinar.